okay. We are, there we go. We should be recording now. And let's go ahead to the presentation and resume. Uh, we've been talking about sponges. The next major phylum uh, to cover is a big one and an important one. Well, they're all important, but it's the phylum Cnidaria. Uh, Cnidaria includes anemones, uh, um, jellyfish, corals, uh, soft corals, and various others. Um, there are freshwater Cnidarians. Uh, there's even freshwater jellyfish, although actually spotting them is kind of a chancy thing. Uh, they can seemingly disappear for years and then pop back up if there's a bloom. Uh, we'll cover those later. Uh, but the majority of them are marine. Uh, Cnidarians have true tissues. Uh, they've got layers of cells that are stuck onto these felt-like basal laminas or basement laminas of collagen four, and they're made of two basic tissue layers. On the exterior of the body is an epidermis. On the interior of the body, there's a gastrodermis, and between the two is jelly. Uh, the jelly may be very thick or it may be a very thin layer. Um, the jelly is called mesoglea. It's made mostly of collagen and it may or may not have cells embedded in it, depending on what type of cnidarian you've got, but it's not considered a true tissue. So cnidarians are kind of like folded sandwiches. You've got a layer of bread on one side, a layer of bread on the outside, and a layer of jelly in between, which can range from very thin to, if you're like my son, very, very thick, slopping all over the place. Right. Uh, almost all members, except for a few that have lost these, have specialized intracellular structures uh, called nidae. Uh, that's Greek for a nettle, a uh, plant that has stinging hairs on it. And the nidae are the stings. Uh, the nidae are what uh, jellyfish use to sting you if you step on one or brush up against one. And they're found inside specialized cells called nidoblasts. Uh, there's a sac-like gut. Uh, the body is basically a bag. Uh, there is a mouth, uh, but there is no separate anus. Uh, the way out is the way in, as it were. Um, any waste that's left over after digestion is just spit right back out of the mouth. And the gut uh, often has branches on it, and the branches can be pretty extensive. Uh, they can form these rather complicated networks. And because the gut branches in most species, there's no part of a typical cnidarian uh, that's very far from the gut. So all of the parts can absorb digested food. Um, since there's water filling the gut, they may be able to do gas exchange as well. And that sac-like but often branching gut uh, is called the gastrovascular cavity. And we still say it's sac-like because even though um, it may have all of these branches, there's still only one way, uh, there's still only one way in and uh, uh, the way out is the same as the way in. It's still basically a bag, albeit sometimes a very fancy bag. Sorry, I quit presenting there for a second. Here we go, we're back on the slides. Right. Three of the four major Cnidarian classes show an alternation between an asexual and a sexual stage. You get this kind of alternation of generations in lots of different animals, a surprisingly large number, the ultimate reason for why may be that sexual reproduction has the advantage of you generate genetic diversity and you repair DNA damage in your offspring if you can reproduce sexually. The advantage of asexual reproduction is it happens a lot faster. Now, you don't have to waste any time finding a mate 
uh, you just decide you want offspring and poof, there they are. They just kind of butt off. So asexual reproduction tends to be rapid. Sexual reproduction repairs your DNA and builds genetic diversity, which is in and of itself a very good thing. Uh, so like many animals and like Miley Cyrus, Cnidarians get the best of both worlds, as it were. You don't have to admit it, but I know some of you watch that. Uh, anyway, the asexual stage sits there on the bottom, typically, and is called a polyp, uh, where you have the mouth up and tentacles usually waving up in the current, and the side opposite the mouth is the side that attaches to the bottom. Uh, you'll see what this looks like in just a minute. And those will reproduce by budding, and at some point they will bud off uh, free swimming. A uh, stage called a medusa, which is what we think of as a jellyfish. And uh, the medusa will butt off, swim around for a bit, and do whatever it does, and then reproduce sexually. Medusas have the actual gonads to make eggs or sperm. And the eggs or sperm will fuse, form an embryo, and the embryo will sink to the bottom and grow into a new polyp. So you're alternating between polyps that bud asexually and medusas that swim and produce eggs and sperm. Uh, we call this a dimorphic life cycle. It's also called metagenesis. Almost all cnidarians are primarily carnivorous. Um, they're almost all predators. Uh, there are some that can soak up dissolved organic matter directly from the water. And there's many that contain symbiotic uh, single cell protists, either symbiotic dinoflagellates, <laughs> excuse me, or single celled green algae, either zooxanthellae or zooochlorellae. Um, there are some that have lost the ability to feed and they're completely dependent on their symbionts. Uh, there's others that use symbionts, but are certainly not averse to eating when they get the chance. So they'll use the symbionts as kind of a dietary supplement. Uh, but there are a few that are completely dependent on their symbionts and don't even have a functioning mouth anymore. But the typical lifestyle of an Idarian is that they're carnivores, they're predators. So the first group we'll talk about is the exception uh, to that rule that cnidarians have a dimorphic life cycle, and that is the class Anthozoa that never have a medusa stage, and they reproduce sexually and asexually while they are still polyps. Uh, the polyps will have little masses of gonad tissue, um, but they will um, also very often be able to bud or split in two or fragment uh, or otherwise reproduce asexually as well. Unique features of anthozoa, uh, the gut is still, again, basically bag-like. Uh, the, uh, there's a mouth, and within the mouth, the gut is kind of turned inward into a tube that extends from the mouth into the gastrovascular cavity, kind of like a tube hanging down into the open cavity. Uh, that groove, uh, it's called the actinopharynx, uh, has one or sometimes two grooves on it that are covered with flagellated cells that pump water into the animal. Uh, so anthozoans typically get their structural support uh, by being filled with water. If you ever get the chance, uh, go um, walking around, if you can do it safely, on uh, rocks on a nice rocky coastline in a place like Washington or Oregon or Northern California, uh, because every so often you'll step on a uh, green sea anemone, uh, one of these big anemones that they have out there close to the low tide line, and if you accidentally step on one, uh, they'll contract all of their muscles and shoot a uh, burst of water uh, out as they deflate very rapidly. 
So you can make the anemone shoot water. Um, and then uh, the siphonoglyph will reinflate their gastrovascular cavity uh, with water. So by doing this, they can expand to a pretty large size or shrink down very small very quickly um, using that siphonoglyph to pump water in and then contracting to squirt it out. And then finally, you've got sheets of tissue that extend from the body wall into the gastrovascular cavity. So a typical sea anemone in cross-section is going to look like this. The mouth is in the center of a ring. Uh, sometimes there's more than one ring, uh, but at least one ring of tentacles. Uh, the tentacles just kind of wave in the breeze. And the tentacles are studded with uh, these stinging cells. And the mouth is in the middle of the ring of tentacles in the middle of that upper surface of a sea anemone is called the oral disc. And the mouth opens into this tube, uh, the pharynx or actinopharynx that extends down into the gastrovascular cavity. Uh, so engulfed food gets passed down that actinopharynx into the gastrovascular cavity where it gets digested. Uh, running along the sides of the pharynx, you have these siphonoglyphs that inflate it with water. And so, um, you have webs of tissue that grow from the outer surface, from the body wall, towards the pharynx, and in this case, some of them will actually attach to the, uh, the pharynx, uh, forming sort of thin sheets of tissue that link the pharynx with the outside and keep the pharynx from getting turned inside out or anything like that. They tend to lock it in place that way. Uh, there's some live ones. Uh, the anthozoan tentacles are on the edges of the oral disc. Uh, the one that you're seeing at the right, uh, you can see lots of tentacles, and the oral disc is just that dark area that they're all branching from. Uh, the one on the left, the oral disc happens to be rather frighteningly large. Uh, so you have this hugely expanded oral disc, and then the tentacles, looks like there's two rows in this case, are uh, branching off the edges of uh, the oral disc. And in this one, the oral disc is a whole lot wider than the actual body is. Um, this particular anemone, the one on the left, can actually face upstream and capture prey with that big wide oral disc. Uh, both of these just happen to be from about 1900 meters down in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they're uh, anemones in the deep sea as well as in very shallow water. Uh, but I chose this picture because the one on the left shows that oral disc very nicely because the oral disc is damn huge. If you cut a slice through a sea anemone, you can see the outer wall. Um, you can see a slice through that actinopharynx, or just, it's called pharynx here, in the center. Um, in an anemone, the actinopharynx will actually have a pair of those siphonoglyphs and then you have these septa branching off the outside of the body wall, and some of those septa go all the way to the actinopharynx, you know, forming these sheets of tissue, um, and others are incomplete. Uh, they don't meet the actinopharynx all the way. They're just kind of there fluttering in the breeze. Uh, those increase the surface area available for digestion, and the complete septa, again, also lock the actinopharynx in place and keep it from getting, you know, turned inside out or something like that. Uh, if you want to, you can look at this. This is a cross section through a sea anemone. You've got a similar slide. Uh, a lot of students find it confusing uh, because there's other things in there. Uh, these slides are not always easy to parse. Uh, to interpret visually, but the kind of long, irregular, oval-shaped thing in the center is the actinopharynx, and you can see septa. Uh, there's one pair at about the one o'clock, and one at the three, and one at about the five, the seven, and the ten. 
each of those pairs starts at the body wall on the outside and extends all the way to the actinopharynx. Those are complete septa. And then at about your two o'clock, you can see some incomplete septa. What might make this confusing is that there's a whole bunch of stuff in between all of the septa. And I'm going to go back one or a few. Down at the base of that diagram, um, you can see some structures called, uh, they're labeled a contium. And a contium is a filament that grows off the septa, but the acontia can be ejected out of the body wall or sometimes out of little pores in the sides. The pores are called synclides, if you must know. Uh, the live ones that I'm hoping to get in, and it probably won't be this week, but it should be next. Uh, the live ones that I'm hoping to get it, get for us to observe actually have these acontia, and it's cool. If you irritate the heck out of an anemone, it'll actually shoot these acontia out of its mouth and out of its sides at you, and the acontia are loaded with these stinging cells. And what you're seeing in the middle that looks like pinkish scrambled eggs, uh, that's actually a whole bunch of coiled up acontia that have been sliced through. Um, these are these filaments uh, that can be protruded through the body. And they don't look like filaments, but you're seeing a slice through them all bunched and bundled up. Uh, but anyway, that's what those are. Uh, this can be a confusing slide to see. So if you don't get all of that, don't worry about it too much. But give it a look if you get the chance. Uh, that happens to be two corals, and you can see that one of them has these white cottony filaments that are spreading out over another one. The one at the top that's kind of brownish is sending these filaments out that look like spider webs to cover um, the other coral, which is uh, kind of a reddish in color. And what's going on is that these corals are competing for space. And the one up at the top is sending out these acontia that are stinging to death and even digesting uh, the coral below that's more red. Uh, so two coral colonies that are growing next to each other can have these god-awful battles uh, where each one shoots out acontia um, trying to sting and kill uh, anybody encroaching on its space. And corals are absolutely vicious, um, except for the fact that the fights take weeks. Uh, I will post to the playlist uh, some time-lapse footage of two coral colonies fighting over space, and it's kind of horrible. You end up with a kind of uh, dead zone in between the coral colonies, where any coral that tries to grow in will get stung by the other one. You end up with a kind of, you know, demilitarized zone uh, in between uh, the coral colonies. So, yeah, there's vicious fighting going on on your average coral reef. It's horrible, I tell you. Okay, right. There's two major subgroups of anthozoa. We can call them octocorals and hexacorals. The octocorals, each polyp has eight tentacles, hence the name octocoral. Virtually all of these guys are colonial. And then hexacorals, instead of having eight tentacles, they've got approximately, approximate multiples of six tentacles and six septa or pairs of septa. Uh, many of these are colonial as well, but others are solitary. So octocorals are often informally called soft corals, although some of them actually do make very hard skeletons. Hexacorals include reef building corals, you know, the corals that everyone thinks of when you think of a coral reef, uh, but they also include solitary ones like sea anemones and tube anemones. So your typical octocoral um, has, you know, gastrovascular cavities. And the gastrovascular cavities are actually connected by little tubes that link all of them together. The tubes are called solenia. And the tubes are kind of buried inside this common tissue called the senosarc. Uh, seno means common and sarc 
uh, is the Greek word for flesh. I hope you never have to deal with this personally, but a sarcoma is one type of cancer. Sarcoma, flesh tumor. Uh, tumor of, I think that's a tumor of the connective tissue, is a sarcoma. Uh, same root here in sinosarc, common flesh. So if any one individual catches food and eats it, um, all of them get to share in the digested food. Uh, kind of like if I had all of you in one room and I could somehow implant uh, tubes that connected all of your stomachs together. So whenever one of you ate, the others would pitch in in the digesting. Uh, that's really kind of horrifying and in a kind of human centipede way. But um, that's what octocorals do all the time. I'm kind of sorry I brought it up. Uh, so this is a view of a live one. This is so-called organ pipe coral. This one actually does make a hard skeleton, uh, one that actually looks a little bit like, um, you know, organ pipes bundled together. Uh, you can sometimes find this in souvenir shops and things like that. And you can see that each polyp, you know, each one of these, you know, stages has um, eight tentacles. Uh, there's a mouth inside each one of them in that white star looking thing at the center of each polyp, although you can't clearly see it here. And very typical of octocorals is the tentacles being branched. So you have what look like eight feathers uh, growing from the center and um, um, each one of those is a branching tentacle. Uh, so-called soft corals can look like this. This is a living one. It's in a subgroup called the Alcyonacea. Don't memorize that. Uh, the white things you can see are actual spicules embedded in the mesoglea. Uh, we talked about spicules of um, uh, sponges, but they're not the only critters that make them. Um, uh, soft corals make them as well. And I was hoping I actually had a slide, uh, by the gods, I actually do, uh, that shows you what these spicules look like. I'll cut to a slide in just a sec. Uh, one soft coral that you might see is so-called gorgonians, uh, a.k.a. sea fans. Uh, these have an internal skeleton that's uh, tough and rubbery and that you can dry out and, I mean, you know, sometimes find in, you know, cheap souvenir stores and things like that. Uh, but that internal skeleton is covered in sinosarc with lots of little polyps, and they can grow in this fan-like or sometimes in a whip-like structure. And they can also include sea pens, uh, which are uh, have two size classes of polyp. You're looking at a deep sea one called veratillum, that central kind of pinkish thing that makes up most of the actual body is actually one giant polyp and branching off it you have a whole bunch of secondary polyps and those are the things that look like little feathers uh, each of which with eight tentacles uh, so the secondary polyps all branch from the sides of the ginormous primary polyp and you get veratillum and the digestive cavities of all of the secondary polyps empty into the common primary polyp. Uh, we actually have to had someone in the department years ago who used to order these live. Uh, this is a so-called sea pen. Uh, it's another alcyonarian soft coral that's made up of a single large polyp and a whole bunch of small polyps. And in this case, the secondary polyps group together to form what are called polyp leaves. Uh, so each one of those kind of flat, fleshy extensions branching off of the central polyp is a leaf-like structure with the secondary polyps growing off it, making that kind of white fuzzy stuff that you see on one edge of each one of those polyp leaves. And I mentioned, give me a second to plug in the uh, scope again. I mentioned that soft corals often have spicules, uh, just like sponges do. 
well, my last year in grad school, a group of friends of mine and I went down to Baja, California, uh, went down to the Gulf of California to collect specimens for one guy's research and skin dive and snorkel. And, well, I never did this, but everybody else took drugs. But um, they like going out in the desert with a head full of shrooms. But, you know, man, I got the straight edge. I never did that, I'm afraid. Um, the druggies all now have better jobs than I do. But anyway, um, yeah, see what that gets you. Uh, but one of the things that I collected down there was a washed up uh, sea fan, uh, washed up uh, Gorgonian, one of these things that look like big fans or whips. And I brought it with me when I got my job here. And uh, you can scrape off the dried Cenosark and make a microscope mount of it. And that's what some of these, uh, a previous class did. And what you should be seeing here and I hope you appreciate this because driving back over a thousand miles of desert road with somebody who's just coming off having taken shrooms uh, on about a 1.8 lane wide highway uh, was probably not the safest thing I've ever done. So I hope you appreciate the risk I took to bring this to you. Uh, but this slide is full of spicules extracted from this sea whip that we collected uh, in the Gulf of California. And spicules can have lots of different shapes. Uh, this, there are some that are very elongated, you know, look almost like bananas or even needles. Uh, this particular one is short and has these kind of blunt ends and then has a pair of kind of ring-like extensions wrapping around it. Uh, so you're seeing one there from the side. Uh, that's a, 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 a C-pen spicule. Uh, there's a, maybe the same one. Okay, that's one you're seeing kind of standing on end. Uh, but over here, there's another one seen from the side. Okay, there's an, yet another one at a, um, at a slightly different, yeah, that's also seen from the side. Uh, so these spicules have, have somewhat complex shapes, uh, almost like, um, um, almost spool-shaped. Or maybe like a spool with um, little extensions sticking out of the middle. I'm not I'm, I'm not really good at describing these things, you know, in a situation where I can't draw on the board or use my hands. Uh, but that's what some of these spicules of soft corals uh, happen to look like. We find any more? Sure. There's a broken one. Uh, there's one that's kind of at a funny angle. But yeah, that's the basic shape. And a specialist would use uh, shape and size of spicules in part to tell you what species you were looking at. So there's a couple uh, right there. So we'll go back to uh, presenting the slides. If you want to, if you feel like it, you could look at, um, uh, yours should have a slide like that. So you can look at this if you feel like it. Um, I'm not, uh, strongly emphasizing the prepared slides. Not everybody has these yet, and some of them are tough to interpret if you're doing this cold and I'm not there to point things out. Um, but yeah, you can use these as an enhancement to your educational experience if you're so minded. So those are some of the things that we have that you can see. Oh, there's one group of octocorals of uh, minor commercial use because they have an internal skeleton that's black and glossy, uh, black and glossy enough that you can cut it, polish it, and use it to make jewelry. Um, the soft tissue isn't black, but there's an internal skeleton um, that's nice and black and shiny, and occasionally you'll spot it in the jewelry trade. Okay, there's a hexacoral because at least in theory, it's got tentacles in multiples of six, although I've never really felt like counting. 
Uh, the septa are also in multiples of six. Uh, this is the giant green sea anemone that will squirt water on you if you accidentally step on one uh, while you're wandering through tide pools or walking out on uh, on rocky coastlines. If you ever get the ch if we ever get to effing travel again, um, and you're ever out on the west coast, we have a lot of these. Uh, you'll note that it has lots more tentacles than eight, and the tentacles are not branched. Uh, so this is a very typical, nice, big, beautiful uh, sea anemone. True sea anemones don't form colonies. I mean, they may grow in the same place. You can have big rock surfaces that might be covered with them, but the individuals never form permanent connections to each other. Uh, they're still ultimately separate polyps. They might transiently bud off for a little while, depends on the species, but they don't permanently stay attached. Uh, but a group called the carpet anemones uh, do form permanent colonies where the polyps are all connected. Uh, they're connected by budding from a mat of uh, stolons. And if you've taken botany, you know the word stolon because it's used for the runners uh, that some plants put out to reproduce by. Uh, strawberries put out runners, uh, crabgrass and a fair number of weeds uh, reproduce by, by runners, you know, these horizontal stems uh, that periodically put out bundles of roots. Uh, same word here. The stolons are you know, these little horizontal growths uh, that give rise to polyps that are all connected to each other. Uh, you can sometimes spot these in uh, the saltwater aquarium trade. Um, I'm not going to make everybody do it because it's not convenient for everyone. But And I, I haven't been there myself, but sometime when you get the chance, if you get the chance, uh, there's a pet store called Pet Country in um, that kind of strip mall on the old Marlton Highway um, across the street from Dairy Queen. And they usually have a pretty good saltwater department, and sometimes they'll have these for sale if anybody wants to go see them. Uh, Petco also has a saltwater department. Um, I don't know if they have those. And again, don't make an unnecessary trip. Um, you know, don't risk you know, coming into contact with infection or, you know, driving somewhere you don't absolutely have to. But if you get the chance, this is a place where you could see what these look like alive. Uh, scleractinia is true corals. Uh, certainly the ones that form reefs are colonial, uh, but there are also plenty of solitary corals. Um, the ones that I've seen tend to be, you can get these like washed up on the beach, usually growing, attaching to something else. Uh, one of the things I've got somewhere in my lab is somebody's baseball cap that evidently fell off someone's head and was battered around for maybe, a, maybe months before finally washing up on the coast of Florida, uh, where a colleague picked it up and sent it to me. Um, and of course, it's completely faded and totally shredded. But the uh, what's left of the brim is actually covered with these little stony uh, coral cups uh, made by solitary corals. So not all corals grow together in these big conglomerations called coral reefs. Most reef building corals and all of the ones that live in shallow water depend on the presence of symbiotic dinoflagellates. Uh, on the left, uh, that's a section through uh, some actual coral tissue. And all of those kind of yellow brown looking circular things are dinoflagellates in the genus Symbiodinium. Um, Symbiotic dionoflagellates, they happen to be called zoosanthelae. Uh, there are other corals that might have symbiotic green algae growing inside. And the upshot is that for tropical corals to grow, they've got to have lots of light. 
uh, which means they grow in relatively shallow water. They might get down maybe up to about 200 feet or so, uh, but they've got to have uh, enough light uh, reaching them to grow, and the water's got to be fairly clear. Uh, coral reefs are generally restricted to the tropics because that's the only place where you've got enough sunshine and enough warmth, and you need clear water. They won't grow uh, around uh, river mouths, for example. If you have silt coming in, uh, the corals tend to get fouled. They tend to get covered in silt, and they also get sunlight blocked. Uh, which means that tropical coral reefs are restricted to very clear water. One of the threats to tropical coral reefs is things like agricultural runoff, uh, blanketing the corals and making the water murkier uh, tends to kill them off. You can find solitary corals in much cooler waters, and I'm suddenly forgetting if I remember to include a slide of it, but this is fairly recently realized that there are some very, very large deep sea coral reefs. Uh, one of the biggest coral reefs in the world is off the, uh, just off the Lofoten Islands, which are off the coast of Norway, um, up around the Arctic Circle. I can't remember off the bat if they're just south of it or just north, but they're pretty close to the Arctic Circle, and uh, it's absolutely huge. And the corals there have just adapted to grow and form these colonies uh, without needing light. Uh, they're obviously not tropical reefs. Uh, they live in very deep water, and because they grow very slowly, there's concern as to as damage to them. Uh, there's a lot of deep sea fishing and also oil drilling going off off the coast of Norway, uh, but they're trying to carry these out while protecting these unique deep sea coral reef habitats. Now the question is, did I remember to include a slide? Oh, I did. Good. This is what those look like. Uh, those branching white and brown zigzaggy things uh, are deep water colonial corals. Uh, and as I mentioned, they're at risk from bottom trawling and petroleum drilling, um, and they don't recover very fast. Uh, some of these are estimated to be over 8,000 years old. So yeah, there are actually deep water coral reefs uh, out there, but they're not easy to study because they're so deep down. Yeah, and there's one of the largest coral reefs in the world is a deep water reef off the coast of northern Norway. Uh, between uh, a thousand, uh, that's not a hundred, that's a thousand, a thousand to thirteen hundred feet down. Um, and that community can be home to over twelve hundred other species. You can see a crab, uh, that red thing over to the left, crawling over the, uh, uh, crawling over the coral surface. And anyway, the polyps lay down uh, hard tissue, the shared tissue that connects all of them, the cenosarc, the common flesh, lays down calcium carbonate, the cenosteum, common bone, osteo meaning bone, and then under each polyp there's a cavity that fits the shape of the polyp called a corallite. Uh, there are some corals where the distinction between coralites is lost and the polyps actually fuse together into these kind of weird meandering structures. Uh, each of those is made up of several polyps glommed together, each of those wrinkles in what we call a brain coral. Uh, so yeah, that's a type of coral where you just have lots of polyps that are all kind of joined. And there's another cat stepping on uh, the keyboard. So where were we? Okay, there's our brain coral. Yes, that coral has a brain, unlike you. When corals are stressed for temperature or otherwise stretched, something goes awry with the balance between the host and symbiont, and the corals start expelling their endosymbionts. 
Um, in the foreground, you can see some uh, deer horn coral. Uh, the white part is the coral that's expelled its endosymbionts and it looks white. Uh, at the tips of the coral colonies in the background, you can see this just beginning to happen. Uh, corals that expel their endosymbionts are not dead and they may be able to recover, but they're under heavy stress and they're at risk of dying. And one of the things people have observed is uh, coral bleaching, as it's called, has been increasing in its rates uh, all over the tropics for the past two decades. Uh, this is one of many things that threatens uh, global coral reefs and all of the biodiversity that they support because there's a huge number of other species that live in, on, among, and around uh, tropical reef building corals. Uh, that was a study in 2012 uh, that tried to estimate the amount of coral cover uh, what you're looking at on the left is a map of uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, off the coast of northern Australia. And they tried to measure coral growth at uh, different stations along the reef uh, from north to south. And the red areas are areas of coral loss. The green areas are rates of growth. And you can see there's still some growth happening. Uh, but there's a big red blob in the center that shows you where um, growth is uh, decreasing. Uh, and the total amount of cover, there's a lot of scatter. But if you look at the centers of those box plots, uh, you can see how the total amount of coral cover has decreased from an average of uh, as much as 30% down to an average of as low as 10%. Uh, and this is happening all over the world. Um, the uh, live coral cover in the Caribbean has declined by 80% since 1977. Um, there are some that have predicted that we're going to lose most of our coral reefs completely by the year 2050. Um, I don't know that the prediction is quite that precise, but if you've ever wanted to go snorkeling or scuba diving on a tropical coral reef, now would be a pretty good time to do it because it is at best uncertain how much longer we're going to have these. The reason, by the way, why anybody should give a bleep as to why whether we have tropical coral reefs or not is that it was estimated back in 20, 2003 that if you could magically preserve all of the coral reefs as they were in all of the world's tropics, if you could preserve them and use them sustainably, which just means in a way that enables you to keep doing it from year to year, uh, they would generate almost $6 billion worth of seafood, uh, nine and a half, almost $10 billion per year from tourism and recreation, you know, people going to fish or to skin dive or scuba dive or sit on beaches and get brought rum drinks with uh, paper umbrellas, uh, five and a half billion a year from future drugs, because one of the other hot frontiers in drug development that isn't sponges is, guess what, soft corals. For the same reason, if you're a soft, squishy invertebrate that can't run, it helps if you taste bad, and you know it helps if you're poisonous, and an awful lot of poisons are medicines if you can figure out how to use them and how to give the right dose. As Paracelsus said, it's the dose that makes the poison. Oh, and they'd also generate $9 billion per year in indirect economic benefits because coral reefs can protect coastlines from storm damage. If you have big waves coming off the open sea, uh, the waves will break on the reef uh, they can damage the reef, but a healthy reef can grow back. Broken corals can just, fragments of broken coral can sprout into new coral colonies. So the reef can go back relatively quickly if it's healthy. And all those surges that are breaking on the barrier reef are not breaking in the lobby of your new hotel or the living room of your beach house. Uh, so having barrier reefs available protects coastlines from storm damage 
and the indirect benefit of not having to pay ridiculous insurance premiums and not having to rebuild every time there's a tropical storm coming your way has been estimated at a total of $9 billion per year. Uh, so tropical reefs are extremely valuable and it would be not just sad from a dirt hippie tree hugging perspective, uh, but sad from an economic perspective uh, if we were to lose these. And a lot of the loss is probably baked in at that, this stage. Uh, one of the causes of bleaching is temperature stress, and that's been linked to this global climate change thing. Uh, that I hate to tell you this, but it's not actually a Chinese hoax. It is, in fact, happening. When you're done worrying about the pandemic and uh, the uh, protests and the uh, um, and the presidency, uh, don't forget to worry about global warming. It's part of a healthy, balanced diet of worries. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause there. My spidey sense is telling me it's 10.48. Uh, let's see, where are you guys? Okay, I seem to have stopped presenting. Okay, was everybody able to see that adequately? All right, am I able, able to reach everybody pretty much? Uh, let me see, I've got no new questions on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the thingy, the, uh, the chat. So I've got 1049, so I will turn off uh, recording now.